everyone. So today, uh, welcome to part three of my Healthy Gut Happy Life series. This time we're talking about a very specific topic and one of my favorites um, and a very common thing in my own practice, parasites. So this is me, some contact info here. It'll also be at the end. So if anyone has questions and you wanna message me, feel free to email me. So this, we're gonna start with 101. Parasites are something that often get ignored or uh, missed or forgotten about. Um, so we're gonna define them. We're gonna talk about where you find them in the body and why they stick around and can be so difficult to get rid of. So what is a parasite? So anything, any organism that lives on a host in or on a, another organism and it gets its food at the expense of that host. So that's an important point that it gets its food at the expense of its host. So any parasite, whether it's in our gut or in our blood, is going to deprive us of nutrients. And this becomes really important when we start to look at the symptoms that are caused by intestinal parasites. So types of parasites. We've got worms, which are on the macro end of the scale, uh, end of the spectrum. They're easy to see, um, all different kinds there. I've highlighted or bolded the ones that I see pretty commonly. I'd, I'd probably add pinworms to that too, but roundworms are really common. Giardia and Cryptosporidium, which anyone who's been a hiker or camper is probably familiar with these. Blastocystis hominis, I put in its own category because it's very, very common and comes up on testing a lot. I added this one is not an intestinal parasite. It can affect the gut, but it also lives in the bloodstream. It's in its own category, but we're gonna talk just briefly about it because I think it's important. And then anything obvious, hair and body lice and scabies. Um, I don't see as much of that, but definitely in certain populations you will. And malaria. Uh, we also don't see a lot of that in the United States, but worldwide malaria is actually the number one parasite that kills the most people. So a little bit about um, each of these. So blastocystis is the most prominent found in stool samples, and many people actually think it's just part of our healthy microbiome. So you can see there about 73% um, of healthy people have it. So a lot of people think this is just part of our normal microbiome that goes out of balance and then immunocompromised people actually less. This to me is one that when it shows up is an indicator that there are probably other parasites lurking that we're just not finding as readily. Um, it's found on microscopic exam. Typically it can come in many forms and it has a cyst form. Some parasites do this where they roll up into a tight little ball uh, and they basically go to sleep. They kind of become dormant. They wait out whatever onslaught is happening and then they come back to life. So they can, this, this one can be very tough to get rid of. So how we get parasites, one of the ways, very common ways that we get uh, parasites is through foodborne illness. So often we think we just had bacterial illness, goes away in a couple of days, you know, everyone's probably had this traveler's illness eating at a restaurant. But what often happens is parasites come along with that food poisoning and what we treat or sometimes don't even treat is the bacterial portion but the parasites can linger a long time after and these are just numbers of what's most common around the world this is global not just the u.s but you can see that giardia is by far the highest and that makes sense because it's in fresh water it's a waterborne illness um, and then i just threw in some others that i see pretty commonly cryptosporidium and giardia often come together um, Ascaris lumbricoides is the big round, long round worm, and we're going to talk more about that one, one of my favorites. So Giardia and Cryptosporidium, were, you know, a lot of people think this is just an acute thing. You drink out of a stream while you're camping, you get diarrhea, it goes away in a couple days, you're fine. And that's true, but this can also become chronic, especially if the terrain of the gut is already a little out of balance. Um, these sneaky little bugs will just stay in there and in lower levels and can cause slow accumulative problems over time. In the United States, these are United States statistics, it's been steadily on the rise since 1990. I'm not sure why, maybe we just pay more attention. Uh, it's found in municipal water supplies all over the U.S. and there are commonly outbreaks from time to time. So even this means treated water. 
It's common in all bodies of fresh water. It comes from animals that you know urinate or defecate in the water. And it can cause the acute symptoms and chronic. So don't forget, there is a chronic component to this. This one is the one that scares people because it's large. You can see the size there. The females are larger than the males. Um, often when I start treating parasites in people, we know they have blastocystis, maybe they've got some yeast overgrowth, maybe a couple others microscopically showed up on a stool test. And as soon as we start treating, we start seeing these. And some people aren't phased, most people freak out. I think it's much more common to have worms small to large of varying sizes than people think. Um, so don't feel like you're alone if you're in this camp. And I put in th this life cycle of Ascaris lumbricoides is similar to other worms as well, like threadworms, which are also pretty common, much smaller and not as easy to see. But it has a two-stage life cycle where it goes through the lungs and then you cough up, um, you cough it up and swallow the, the juveniles back down and you reinfect the gut. This is part of the reason this one is, these types of um, infections are hard to get rid of. They attach very strongly to the gut lining, but they also are constantly in different phases of their life cycle, and you have to target them in both phases at all times to really get rid of them. So just a brief segue into mycoplasma pneumoniae because also in my practice treating parasites comes a lot of mold exposure with mycotoxins, yeast overgrowth, and Lyme disease and co-infections. And mycoplasma is probably the most common Lyme disease co-infection. It's very, very tiny. You can see there about 5,000 of them can fit into one red blood cell, whereas most other microscopic bugs, only about 10 to 15 can fit into that same space. So it's very small, which just means it can get into every nook and cranny of the body and become very, very um, stuck and entrenched. And because it's so small, it also makes it hard for the immune system to find it in those places that it hides. It's also one of those airborne bacteria that causes walking pneumonia. So many of us have been exposed to it. And if our immune system is depleted enough, it can linger um, after we've been exposed. And we may not get walking pneumonia. We might not have the symptoms, but we've been exposed to it. And it will just sort of hang around until our immune system becomes depleted enough. And then it will start to replicate. And it often gets uh, forgotten in chronic Lyme treatment uh, because all the other organisms sort of take center stage. And I've often seen where mycoplasma can linger many years after uh, the other infections are cleared up and become, can become very chronic and mimic some of the Lyme disease, especially the joint symptoms. And it, is, it can really infect the gut lining, which not all Lyme co-infections can. So if there's gut issues along with some of the other joint pains and whatnot, mycoplasma might be involved. And it's very, very, very resistant um, to pretty much every antibiotic that we have. So this one takes a little more work to get rid of. So this is just a little definition about it. Um, it's associated with walking pneumonia, but it can lead to infections in other sites. And I would say these are chronic infections in other sites of the body skin, central nervous system, blood, heart, and joints. I would add gut to that as well. It can be car become part of an imbalanced gut microbiome and can cause destruction to the collagenous tissues of the gut lining. So it can cause a lot of problems and make the clearing of other parasites a little bit more difficult. So where do parasites, so now we're gonna go back to the gut. I took a little minor segue. So like that image showed of Ascaris, adult worms can live uh, in the lining of the stomach, small and large intestines. They also can go through the lungs. So there's that life cycle. They adhere very tightly to the lining of the gut. So even like in this really gross looking slide, you can actually see them because they're so large. It would take a lot of effort by the body to dislodge them and some of the treatment is scraping them off the gut lining kind of in a mechanical sense using various um, herbs and treatments so but they can live in other parts of the body and I put the three I most commonly see lungs liver and gallbladder particularly liver and gallbladder there's often a lot 
lot of gallbladder issues with um, parasites, especially worms. So we always get them through contaminated food or water, um, and you could ingest any of them at any stage of their life. It could be eggs, babies, um, or actual full-grown microscopic adults. They often come along, like I mentioned, with bacterial food poisoning, which gets all the press because of the violent symptoms it produces. Uh, we can also get certain ones through our skin. Um, hookworms can come in through the feet, and we can get them from our pets. So pets often, especially dogs, because we tend to snuggle with dogs and let them lick our faces and they lick parts of their bodies and they often have parasites and they can transmit uh, microscopic eggs to us that way. So don't let, kiss your dog, but don't let your dog kiss you. And then people often ask me, I have no, they'll say, I have no idea how I got parasites. Why me? Like, why did I end up you know, I went on this vacation with all these other people and I was the only one that got sick or I'm the only one that's in my family that's ended up with this chronic parasitic infection. So why my system? That could be a whole talk in and of itself about uh, terrain and susceptibility. But there's a lot of factors that go into it. Most of it is time and a chronic accumulation of things over time, which burdens your immune system, usually in slow incremental bits over time. So stress, antibiotic use, chronic stress especially, little infections here and there that we're exposed to like mycoplasma pneumoniae, maybe food poisoning. And with each event, our body seems to deal with it just fine, but it maybe leaves some traces behind each time, which just slightly weakens and burdens the immune system until we hit a point where the immune system can't keep up anymore. Um, there are also quite a few people where their gut is just the weak area of their system. You know, they always had nervous stomach as a kid. They got all kinds of illnesses just manifested in the gut, constipation, diarrhea. Um, and if you're one of those people like me, I've always kind of had things centered in my own gut, you will tend to pick up things that other people don't because it's kind of just a general weak area for you. And knowing that, you just need to be a little extra cautious. Microbiome imbalance is set up by all of these things. So this accumulation of stuff over time throws your normal balance of yeast, parasites, and bacteria out of balance. And most people end up with predominantly yeast or fungus and parasites and not enough good bacteria. Antibiotic use depletes our good microbiome, our good bacteria with one a one week course of a standard antibiotic can disrupt your microbiome, throw it out of balance for up to a year. Um, and most people I'd say take antibiotics once a year, once every couple of years. Um, some people would say you're human, you have parasites. I don't, don't know if I agree with that, but I think we all have some microscopic parasites, but humans are just prone to all of these things um, and this accumulation of systemic immune system burden. And chronic stress is a huge one. So it's not so much the big stressors like death of a loved one, quitting a job, those sorts of things. Those are chinks in the armor in moments in time, but it's the chronic, repetitive lack of sleep, never feeling rested, not absorbing nutrients from your food well. All of these things are just chronic stressors where eventually the body won't be able to keep up. Parasites can't really live in a healthy system. So there's something weakening the body. Uh, this is about just children. I just thought this was a staggering number, 880 million children infected with intestinal worms. And those are the ones that we know about. I think a lot of intestinal infections, especially in the United States, get missed. So that number is probably a whole lot bigger than that. So how might someone know if they have parasites? I think this is an interesting part of our talk because many people attribute their parasite symptoms to other things. So of course you can have intestinal gut symptoms, diarrhea, which can be acute or chronic, um, maybe subacute, I would say within the first year or two or maybe three of an infection and then if it's longer if the parasites have been around longer than that what i typically see is more constipation sometimes incredibly severe constipation with bowel, move bowel movements every two three four or five days 
of literally feeling like the intestines just aren't moving. And then any of the things you might typically associate with a gut infection, cramping, bloating, heartburn and reflux is common. Uh, there's typically no pattern or no very clear discernible pattern to the symptoms. So the bloating might sometimes be morning, midday, sometimes it's after eating, sometimes it's in the middle of the night. It just doesn't really seem to fit a standard pattern. pattern. And then you may have absolutely no intestinal symptoms. And this is where people, you know, are sort of shocked that they think that you have to have diarrhea, abdominal cramping, nausea, like really bad symptoms to have parasites. And although you would with a very severe acute infection with chronic, you might not have any of that. You might have other symptoms. So some signs on blood work, and you can all go back and look at your last round of blood work from your PCP and reinvestigate. Um, these are some things that I've just put together clinically that I see in a lot of my patients. You won't have all of these typically. If you do, it's probably likely. Um, so MPV is platelet volume, so that'll be elevated. MCV is the size of your red blood cells. That can be high or low, or even normal. High eosinophils, which are a type of white blood cell common in allergic reactions like seasonal allergies, sneezing, itching, that sort of stuff any kind of iron abnormalities. So high iron, low iron, low ferritin, um, iron numbers that don't match, they look low in one place and high in another, signs of anemia but high levels of iron. So anything that's weird or off about iron levels could be parasites. Low alk phos, which is from the bone marrow and basically low alk phos and low protein have to do with the overall signs of depletion and malnutrition where the body's not absorbing nutrients well because the parasites are eating a lot of your nutrition. And then low sex hormones across the board, uh, progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, often even DHEA and some of the precursors. And that's where we get into a lot of the other symptoms that you might see uh, that aren't intestinal because a lot of clinical diagnosis of parasites is other symptoms outside of the gut coupled with um, lab markers and a good medical history. So stool tests are tricky. Um, I have for the most part stopped running them when I suspect parasites because false negatives are the norm. You've got two options in the world these days, DNA testing through PCR, either whole genome or partial, depending on the lab, and microscopic exam, which is still the classic standby of, you know, someone taking the sample, putting it on a slide, and looking at slide after slide after slide under a microscope. Um, and microscopic exam is great if you have someone with a well-trained eye, and those are few and far between in most standard labs. So standard stool tests, like you know, through your average Quest, LabCorp, whatever, standard hospital labs are worthless. They always come back negative 99.9% .9 of the time, even in pretty intense parasitic in, uh, infections. There are some third-party labs that are a little better, um, but you might find other indicators on a stool test. With parasites and stool testing, it's often what you don't see or what you see extra of. So a lot of extra gram-negative bacteria, Pseudomonas, Klebsiella, and Entrobacter are common, but there are others. Citrobacter is another one I didn't put on there. High levels of yeast on microscope or culture, and, and a high level of yeast is rare or above. So even rare amount of yeast means you've got billions more lining the digestive tract. So I should say any amount of yeast found in a stool test. Um, low or high secretory IgA, which is the immune system in your gut lining, so it could be depleted and low in a chronic condition or elevated in a more active infection. And all of the other inflammatory markers that are found on, on other stool tests, not, not the stool tests that you would get through a standard lab, but some of the other stool tests, things like um, beta-glucuronidase and lactoferrin and um, things like that, things that uh, just frank blood on a stool test, those sorts of things are almost always normal. And that's partially because parasites lurk right below where your immune system sees them and responds in an inflammatory way. So they're, they're smart. They know to keep themselves kind of at low levels. 
So this is really a little snapshot of what a good microscopic exam, you know, someone with many, many years of experience would be able to look at these things under a microscope and know exactly what it is. This just all looks like a bunch of blobs and circles and squiggles to me and I would have no idea what these things are. But if someone has been looking at this stuff under a microscope for a long time, they're able to really differentiate eggs and the, the microscopic things that you're more likely to actually find on a stool test. Because remember, parasites don't dislodge from the gut lining very well. So maybe you get extremely lucky and that particular stool sample has something in it, but they also have life cycles. And if you get them in a more dormant phase of their life cycle, you're not gonna find much on a stool test. So it's really, really hit or miss. I think your best bet is finding a clinician who really understands parasites and can take a good clinical history um, and using whatever other lab work you already have uh, to confirm the diagnosis. So then this is the more the part that I think more people will relate to because um, the other thing is most people think that their bowel movements are normal. <laughs> there, there is no real normal as far as I think what the general population thinks, but you can look up the Bristol stool chart and that will give you an idea of what normal should be. I think it's number four, three, three or four right in the middle is what healthy bowel movements should look like. Uh, but most people I think have gut symptoms that they're just not aware of. They just don't have severe diarrhea or severe constipation, so they think it's normal for them. But most people do have some gut symptoms if you really ask. But a lot of people have these symptoms. So insomnia of any kind, falling asleep, staying asleep. I see commonly waking up later in the morning, like 3 to 5 a.m., unable to fall back asleep, night sweats. Any hormonal issues, especially chronic, so irregular menstrual periods, short or long, unexplained infertility in women particularly, um, especially when both partners have been tested and everything seems fine. Extreme PMS with rapid mood swings. I mean, extreme to the point where people will have gone to the doctor just for this. Night sweats, hot flashes, hot um, chills, I would add to that as well, or alternating. Irritability, frustration, rage can be in with those rapid mood swings, nightmares, panic and anxiety, especially at night. Um, and then any kind of skin thing, skin rashes, cystic acne, body itching without a rash, uh, anal itching, all of these things are potential parasitic symptoms. So if that section made you think, hmm, I wonder if I have parasites, <laughs> find someone and get tested, um, let them take a really good history, ask a lot of questions. Parasites often rarely they, they rarely, rarely come alone. So they're a big part of it, but there are other things. So if we find parasites, we think they're there, what do we do to get rid of them? This part is tricky. And I will say I have not found one single formula that works for everybody. But if there are digestive symptoms, there is any kind of bowel irregularity, loose stools, IBS, alternating constipation, diarrhea, um, that often conventional treatment will shake things up. It'll sort of take down the load of parasites to a degree that they're more manageable and treatable with other options. So one of the big myths about parasites is that we don't have them in the United States, that this is a third world problem. The faulty logic in that is we have airplanes and people travel and people travel far and wide and people get food poisoning pretty commonly on vacation and think it's just bacterial. That's a very common way I see that people get parasites. But some people just get them from eating a salad at a local restaurant or from drinking water and they don't even get acutely ill. It just becomes a chronic issue. So there are very limited drugs available to us as practitioners in the United States compared to some other countries where the, the broadness of what's available would be cheaper and easier to obtain. This is a list of drugs that I use, although metronidazole I don't. Metronidazole is the easiest one on this list to get other than paramomycin. And I don't really use it. It's, it's a terrible drug in my opinion that can cause a lot of tendon inflammation and, and other side effects that aren't, aren't worth it. 
but you'll notice that the three other drugs at the beginning also end in azole. Albendazole and mubendazole are worm medications. I use them a lot, but they're expensive and hard to get. Um, tinidazole as well, a little easier to get depending on people's insurance. Paramomycin, not as effective, but pretty easy to get. And nitazoxanide, or uh, also known as Alinea, is also great, uh, especially for Cryptosporidium and Giardia. Extremely expensive and hard to get. So, although I like to use conventional medications in certain cases, it can be tricky for a lot of reasons. And so, luckily, as a naturopathic doctor, I've got a lot of other tools in my toolkit. So we can combine these with other things. They're also, there's variable efficacy. They don't always work great. I find that they often work really well the first month and people feel good, but if you try to do it any longer than about 21 to 30 days, people will start to feel really awful. It, it, it takes down the load, but beyond that, they just start to be more depleting in a system that's typically already depleted because of parasites. They're harsh, they cause a lot of side effects. People are sort of willing to put up with the feeling terrible for a period of time because they do feel better, but it often doesn't hold. Um, and what I've come to decide about a lot of these drugs is that recurrence is so common that there's a de if the depletion issue isn't resolved, parasites will just come back. So it, it takes a combination treatment. So I use a whole lot of different things. There's a lot more options in the herbal world. They do need to be used longer term and at pretty high dose and people need to be consistent uh, because of the life cycles of parasites, because of how they attach, because it's really an immune system issue. You also need to rehabilitate the system, both the immune system, the gut lining, improve the overall mix of microbes in the gut. So you really need to rehabilitate, not, rehabilitate, not just kill. Um, there are a lot of options in herbs, so you can get powdered herbs, you can get tinctures, capsule form, tablets, and there's some really great traditional formulas. This is not my area of expertise, but I have colleagues that I can refer to. Chinese medicine custom formulas and Ayurvedic medicine have um, some really good parasite treatment options. So this is a great um, adjunct and follow-up. If you do do conventional treatment, you want to follow it with something that's a little more healing. So this is just a snapshot of a few of the most common plants that I will start with. If I suspect parasites, but the patient hasn't actually seen anything in their stool, I, I should say, especially if I suspect worms, I will give them Mimosa pudica, a pretty hefty dose, four to six capsules once a day on an empty stomach. And if the infection is pretty high, uh, people will often start to see things in their stool within days to a week. And then that gives me enough information to know do we need to go to a pharmaceutical? What other herbs do we need to add? Um, how entrenched is this? So this is a great plant. It's um, called sensitive plant. If you touch it or swipe against it, it curls up and sort of shrinks away and then opens up again. It's the seeds of the plant that are used and they're a little fibrous. So if diarrhea is part of the problem, they can be palliative in the, in the short term. They can help to slow the diarrhea bulk up the stool. The seeds swell when they come into contact with water and so they act like a scraper through the intestine wall, sort of that mechanical scraping of things off of the gut lining. And they're very irritating to parasites. Parasites hate this stuff. So if they're in there, you will kill some of them. Um, some of these are probably pretty common that people have heard of. So Artemisia absentium. There are a lot of Artemisia species. Sweet Annie is another one that is used. This is wormwood. Wormwood is sort of the classic. It's very, very bitter. Um, it's a classic anti-parasitic. It has other properties. All the bitter herbs are also beneficial to the liver and gallbladder, which is typically affected in parasitic infection. So you kind of get um, two for one with a lot of these bitter anti-parasitic herbs. Bitter herbs, just like pharmaceutical drugs, which are also bitter. If you've ever tasted a pharmaceutical tablet, they're extremely bitter. Um, bitter is damaging to the gut lining in the long run. So even these you don't want to use alone for too long. You want to do other things to help nourish the gut lining. And food is a, is a big part of that. 
Neem is an Ayurvedic herb that I also really, really love. Um, similar, so I'm sure you've seen neem oil. Neem is in toothpaste. It has a lot of antimicrobial properties, skin. It's really good for external skin things. This is the powdered leaf typically that's used. Also very bitter, good for the liver and gallbladder as well. Very antiparasitic. These herbs often come in combination with each other. And black walnut, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of. Um, similar, very similar thing, antiparasitic, antimicrobial, antifungal as well, and has some of those same bitter qualities. So the, that's mostly things that kill parasites, and you do have to kill them. This is not a situation where you can simply give a lot of probiotics and nourish the gut lining and repair because there's too much in the way of that repair and until you really scrape it out and kill them, then you can rebalance. But until then, you can't really do the nourish and repair alone. Although I do think it's good. So um, various different probiotics can be used. Food is a big part of this. So when you're eating, how you're eating, what you're eating, and it kind of depends on the person um, because many people don't have just parasites. They commonly have yeast overgrowth and the diet for that is going to be much different but the one commonality between parasites and yeast is fiber um, as long as you don't have SIBO small intestinal bacterial overgrowth because fiber will make SIBO worse so if you have SIBO you really need to treat that first um, but otherwise with just yeast and parasites fiber is good lots of different types of fiber so lots of cooked vegetables whole grains like brown rice and quinoa are going to help scrape out and bulk up the stool. Um, also improving stomach acid and bile flow, especially if constipation is involved. That typically means the bile has gotten gunked up. It's not as smooth and liquidy as it should be, which helps stimulate bowel movements when it's flowing properly. So you want to stimulate, um, not necessarily take stomach acid. I typically use bitter herbs for this that do both stimulate stomach acid production before eating and also improve bile flow. Um, and really killing off the yeast and parasites will, will get rid of constipation uh, pretty much every time. As soon as you break through that initial die off, constipation usually improves really dramatically. The toxins released by both yeast and parasites can literally paralyze the small intestine. So when you get rid of them, the, the muscles start moving better. Um, so adjusting your diet depending on what's actually going on in your gut and it will change as the treatment protocol changes as you improve you'll have more foods in your diet um, and sometimes eating twice a day versus three times is better but again it just kind of depends on the person and always as with everything you want to treat the whole person because parasites cause so many other symptoms in other areas of the body that are not directly the gut you want to really treat any system that's been affected so I'm always looking at people's hormonal system their sleep their energy levels their mood and using supportive supplements and nutrients to help those systems to help the person to feel better to give them what they're depleted in until we can restore balance. Because as you're restoring balance, there can be discomfort. As you're getting rid of paras parasites are one of the most uncomfortable things to treat in the gut. Um, they release a lot of toxins, they cause a lot of cramping and pain that other things don't. And that's one of the ways you might know you have parasites is although the symptoms are erratic, they do tend to be pretty painful. The bloating can be really painful. Constipation or diarrhea can be urgent or painful. There's, there's much more pain involved although it might be sporadic. And then as you're supporting all of those systems that have been affected, you wanna find a protocol or protocols that change that are attacking and getting rid of the parasites and correcting the imbalance in the gut. And then you wanna prevent recurrence. This is a big one. And this has a lot to do with rehabilitating the immune system, rebuilding good microbiome balance. And then when people do travel, you take a little parasite prevention kit with you a little mixture of herbs and supplements that you take every time you eat when you drink water and if you're prone to gut stuff you don't ever want to travel without this 
and then look at all other factors. So if things improve and then they plateau and there's no more improvement no matter how you manipulate the protocol, look for other things. And to me, these things are other toxins, commonly mycotoxins from mold exposure at any point in life. It doesn't have to be yesterday, it could be 20 years ago. To mycotoxins get trapped in our tissues, just like heavy metals and chemicals. And look at other infections, especially if blood work isn't changing and there's a lot of fatigue or pain. And that to me is chronic viral infections like Epstein-Barr and particularly Lyme disease, mycoplasma pneumoniae, other co-infections. And often what will happen when you clear parasites and clean up the gut, if there are any other infections, the symptoms of those infections will become more dominant and the immune system will start to wake up and try to fight them, which is what you want. And remember that parasites rarely, rarely, I've never seen a case of strictly parasites. Even people who have been traveling recently often have an imbalanced terrain that made them more susceptible to the parasites. So you really need to treat the entire gut and everything that's going on, not just the parasites. You'll get much better uh, return on your investment if you treat everything at the same time or step by step. Sometimes you can't do it all at once, but you really need to treat everything that's affecting the gut and rebuild. So that's it for parasites for now. There's more we could talk about for sure. And if you have questions, please email me here at drdrpedro at bewellnaturalmedicine.net. You can find me at Be Well in Mill Valley, California. And stay tuned for our next one. We're gonna talk about yeast. And if you're already in the midst of treatment and curious about what to expect during that treatment, take a look at my quick little short video on what to expect during natural healing. All right, that's it for now, everyone. See you next time.